Welcome to Rising Woman Leaders. I'm your host, Meredith Rahm, and I believe the time has come for women to share their gifts, their voice, and their stories. I love seeing women spiritually and financially empowered, thriving in their life's work, and doing what they love every day. I've gathered a community of women living their dreams to tell us their stories and inspire us to step into more courage, self-love, and feminine leadership. If you like this podcast, follow me on Instagram at Rising Woman Leaders and sign up for email updates at risingwomanleaders.com. Now get cozy with a journal and a cup of tea. I hope you enjoy today's show. I'm here today with Lara Rose Duong, who is a spiritual advisor to individuals of exceptional wealth. Offering bespoke, intuitive guidance and energetic calibration for private clients, she's based in Canada and working with clients across the globe, both remotely and in person. Thanks for being here, Laura. Thank you so much for having me and having me part of this conversation. Yeah, well, I was excited to find your work just through many of different facets and women that um, that I know you're connected to. And money has always been something that I am so curious about and want to engage with and want to learn everything I can with, especially being a business owner and entrepreneur. Um, and I have to say, when I started my business, I wasn't really in that place and I didn't know where to start. And I had to, you know, come across books. And I remember one of the first books um, you may be familiar with, Marianne Williamson and the Law of Divine Compensation. And I loved just bringing in the, the, uni- the union of spirituality and money and how we can use our money in ways that are really um, – like when we receive money, we are also giving a blessing to others and really honoring our worth and all of that. So over time, I've learned about, you know, honoring the worth and investments and all of that. But I have lots of questions for you. And I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about your money story and just like what your relationship to money was and how you came into a place with it that feels really aligned. I've been on a weird, long, twisty road with money, and I still am. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, it looks like my dog, Nala, wants to join the conversation. Um, Thank you, Nala. (laughs) Um, um, So how did it all start? I think I was really, really blessed to have the parents that I have because my mother in particular is really, really good with money and not just the, like the physical form of it, but the energetics, the, the intentions, the powers behind working with money, honey. Um, so she's always taught me from the very beginning that it's something that comes to us with great ease. If we really have a purpose um, the divine will come in and take care of us. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And I'm really impressed that that's her outlook because she was born in a very small village in Vietnam, grew up in the war, went through the whole refugee, left the country experience and started from scratch in Canada with my father with nothing. And she still had that, had and has that beautiful outlook on prosperity and wealth coming in with ease. So I was really lucky to have that experience growing up. Um, And then once I was more, you know, young adulting and handling money myself, I essentially ignored everything that my mother ever taught me. (laughs) <laughs> we have to go through that, right? The rebellion. Right. Yes. <laughs> Ignored everything um, and, you know, put myself into a lot of debt. There was that experience as a young adult. And then my mother helped me get out of that experience and, and taught me how to take care of things. And then 
I was really on top of it. I was like following the systems that she taught me, <clears throat> excuse me, following the energetics, the spiritual, the whole thing. And at one point, my health went way downhill. And, you know, the old thing that they say when it comes to money, the worst thing that can happen to your money is a divorce or bad health. Because it can really blow up your finances if you're not prepared and like ready to receive support in all the mm -hmm. forms that it comes. Um, so I had to learn how to stay in that space of gratitude and appreciation and willing to accept while going through the financial difficulties of supporting a health scenario. And then I recovered from that, again, using my mother's tools, working with my divine teams and all that kind of stuff. So eventually she encouraged me to go into, um, my mother encouraged me to go into um, financial advising. So I went the, the traditional route of learning the schooling, opening up my own thing, joining a corporation, which was great. But I found that that industry works from a place of fear, um, fear to motivate action as in put instill fear of the future and the unknown to encourage you to save and to plan. And that doesn't sit with me too well in the sense that I would rather let love move our actions, let love inspire us because I feel like love begets more love, hope begets more hope. We need to make decisions, take actions from that place. Um, so that's when I left the financial corporate world and decided to focus solely on working on the energetics and supporting like the soul conversations around our legacy and our money. So I still have my days where I don't even want to look at money and I have to realize, okay, like where am I in my cycle? hormonally speaking, yeah. where is the moon? And just allow myself to feel that stress and then move through it and know that if I if I trust the altar within and my divine team, things do get taken care of ultimately. Yes. That is beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's good to hear just the ups and the downs and the places where things are challenging. And I'm sure a lot of us have had those health moments or those um, moments where it's like, unless you really prepare yourself, you don't know what's going to happen. And I want to bring up just like, I think for a lot of people, really looking at your money, really being in that inquiry can be pretty confronting. Mm -hmm. especially if there is um, debt or you haven't been looking at it in a long time. Um, so I wonder what tips you have around beginning to form that relationship again, beginning to bring some ease and some more of the loving energy back into relationship with money. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Where to start? Um, I think I say this quite often, but I always like to come back to clarity as the first place, allowing yourself to see things for what they are. Because um, so often we can hide the truth from ourselves and that can make things more difficult. So just like any relationship, whether it's with another human being, an animal, um, our money, we need to have clarity, be honest with each other, really look at each other, look at what we want for real, not just external ideas of what we want, but when we like check inside and go, what do we really want to do with our money? What do we really want our money story to look like? Um, having clarity and honesty around that and then having honesty around, okay, well, where did I learn my money honey practices? You know, where they were they where like are there stories that I, I took on from my ancestors? Are they stories that I took on from my parents, from my community, from television? And go, okay, I'm not putting those people in a place of blame. It's just like being honest with ourselves. Like sometimes we weren't given um the opportunity to learn how to be with money. 
So let yourself be honest about that. Wow, like I didn't get a chance to learn about taxes or budgeting or goal setting or anything. And then just like any type of relationship or task, we need to give it time and focus. And focus means actually looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Truth telling, transparency, and being willing to go there. Yeah. And, And going there with the knowingness that whatever is happening in that bank account isn't necessarily a reflection of your inherent worth as a human being. Yes. You know, because I used to do that and I still have moments like that where, where, where my finances are sitting can really get wrapped up in my identity. I see that in, in, um, in my, my lover, my love, he, if his finances aren't super prosperous, I can see that he feels emasculated. He feels less than, he feels unable to support and provide. Um, And I have conversations with him around the fact that money doesn't define you. It's a resource, it's an energy, it's a tool that we get to work with and nourish our communities with. So get clear on how you want to nourish, how you want to be nourished, And then usually more often than not, the money arrives. It's like, oh, you've given me purpose and focus. Mm -hmm. I'm here to show up now and work with you. Yes. This is so interesting because just this week, I've been having a conversation with my husband about saving for a down payment for a house. And I have, I can be pretty fixed about like, okay, this is our goal. This is how we're going to get there. This is what we need to do. And he just, before getting on this call, he was like, I need, I need something more than this. Like I need to understand what that goal is going to bring to our life and to other people's lives. And so we like took it a layer deeper and I was like, okay, well, here's what I see. And I was going into it and like thinking about raising a child in the house and thinking about him playing piano in the living room and having the dinner parties and like working in the garden and like it being something that can be so much more. And and then we both were just feeling so much more connected to it. He's like, can we write that down so that every month when I'm depositing that money to this account, I can like, feel yes. that and think about that. <laughs> Can we get your husband on this call? <laughs> he's amazing. Yeah, he's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. And that's exactly it. When we can infuse our intentions with purpose and true emotion and really live that experience, that sets a frequency in our system and we become like like a radio tower broadcasting this frequency and then that the thing that we want is coming. It's it's going to arrive. Um, so I'm so excited that that he like intuitively went there needing that extra nourishment. And that's I love what he said too is how is this purchase going to go beyond us? Like how is it going to serve our community? How like what does it con- contribute to? And that's something that I work with um, people a lot is thinking about the full trajectory, like the full lifespan of money, honey, because it exists before it arrives to you and it exists beyond you. Mm -hmm. And so where is it coming from? Think about the journey it's been on, the families it's taken care of before it came to you. And then when you go to, you know, make that down payment or buy the groceries or pay for your gas or, you know, pay for your meal out, where does that money go to? What families does it take care of after that? And that's a way to connect with the the healthy aspect of of money, honey, versus this idea that money is evil or something beyond us, something that exists to punish us, which is like a story that does exist out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm just kind of like getting this visual of alignment, like the energy body, the emotional body, the physical manifestation, like coming into that alignment. Yeah. 
Um, and I notice this just about your work. There's this energy of intention and even just like being on your website or knowing, you know, the reading some of your blog posts, there's this energy behind it of like being really clear and like, you know, that intention, that clear intention and what, what it is for, why it's here, where it's going, that, and I imagine that's something you work on with your clients too. Would you want to speak about that? Yeah, absolutely. And and not just with my clients. I work on that with myself because that that came from a place of of um of how to empower myself to work with money wisely. And I say that because when I was young adulting, and maybe not so young as well, adulting. Um, I found myself in at times like just so easily buying things, buying courses, buying crystals, buying dresses, buying um, events, activities, and easily justifying any purchase. And all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, like you have gone way beyond your budget. Like there is like budget is not even in sight at this point. Like, are we going to pay rent? You know, making crazy um, expenditures like that. And I realized at one point, I mean, this should not be such a big realization, but it was for me that I was, I was spending unconsciously. Yeah. The same way that we can spend our energy unconsciously. So I do now really move with a lot of intention because it's, if I'm going to make an action, do something, I want to make it worthwhile. I want it to have an impact. I want it to have purpose because then there isn't buyer's remorse or regret afterwards. I can, if I am in debt, I am now consciously in debt. You know, I I did that purposefully, you know, to make an investment or, or maybe it wasn't an investment, but if I can set up those pillars, like your husband has been suggested, having the purpose for a specific, um, honey pot of money, then when I go to spend it in alignment with that intention, it feels so good. It yeah. feels really, really good. But when I've set up a certain intention over here with a different honey pot and I don't spend in alignment with that, say I borrow it to go and buy lipstick or my chia seeds or whatever, I I can I'll feel guilty in the sense of wow, like I'm not using this um, in alignment with its purpose. You know, I'm not giving it an opportunity to live its full expression. So doing that has helped me be able to reel in my mm-hmm. spending habits and to be able to move with more like consciousness, to, uh, to give myself time to make a decision in a world where there's so much time pressure to do stuff like sign up for this course. It's going to be sold out in two days or the deal is only now. And all those things make sense and they ha- they work and everything. But I found in the long run for myself and, and for my clients that work this way too, that need to work this way, is that even if say you in quotes miss the deal, in the long run, You'll spend less because you haven't purchased like 10, 15 different things. You've only purchased one thing or two things at a, at a, at a cost, at an investment that made sense for you in that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've, you know, throughout my lifetime, I've seen like there's deals on all of the time. Mm-hmm. That's also like working with the power of manifestation. If you want a deal, it, it will arrive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's so great. Something that has helped me is thinking about uh, if there's something, if I'm presented with a choice, something I could buy, something I could invest in, and it's not feeling like, I don't know if that's the best choice. Instead of thinking of it like this is depriving myself of something, like this is actually I'm making a choice for something else that's really going to nourish me. And yeah, I think we can all relate to having a little girl inside who's like screaming and crying and like, no, I want it now. Yes. <laughs> um, but to like kind of tell that part of yourself that 
this we're not taking away from you we're actually like using this money for towards something else that's going to make you even happier <laughs> like way happier it's going to have like a a bigger effect absolutely yeah yeah i i can totally appreciate that i've lived that moment too <laughs> cuz it can be hard sometimes you're like no i need those special fermentation lids now. I'm saying that because I'm looking at fermentation <laughs> lids, but I was like, I really need those special lids now. And I, and I had to have a conversation with myself of actually like you've been using old school methods for a long time. It's working. It's not like it's a not working right now. We're okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any thoughts on just people that are working with limiting beliefs that may have come from their parents or family lines. Um, I know those can run really deep of like scarcity or um, yeah, just that feeling of not enough. How do you, do you have any tips or advice around that? I think it depends on your, your way of being and your way of working with energy and spirituality and your different schools of beliefs. I just say that because, you know, for some people I would say, hey, like get together with your divine team or someone that you trust and start working through your ancestral storylines and, mm -hmm. and, and taking responsibility for the stories, but not necessarily taking ownership because sometimes – you know, these tapes can play and, and these programs can play and like drive our actions and, and suddenly we like own them. We feel like this is the only way that we can be. But truly, if we take, take a step back and go, you know what, this isn't, this isn't my programming, it doesn't have to be, I'm going to take responsibility to, to reframe the scenario, mend some storylines in my lineage. And like, what a blessing because you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it for future generations. Any, yeah. any like children that come after you or children around you, or even it may just be a sigh of relief to your ancestors to be like, oh my goodness, <sighs> that's finally done. Yeah. So I would like work with someone that you feel that you trust. Like it could be um, a private adventure you know, or it's partnered with, with someone that you really trust, or you go to a retreat or whatever and, and just mend those storylines. Um, I think the first thing too is, is to not punish yourself. Like we're already, mm. you know, beating ourselves up. You're probably feeling some form of shame and embarrassment. It's in that moment that we really need to step back and our, allow ourselves to be supported by ourselves, you know, like give your current self the biggest hug <laughs> and so much love and say, you know, we are alive and doing well despite these programs. Yes. Imagine how much better life could be once we mend these programs. Yes. Um, I think those are the two things. There yes. could be more, but we'll see. <laughs> it's so much easier when all of you is on board and working together <laughs> and on the same team rather yeah. than like fractured and part of you is like just saying mean things and you've already screwed it up and who do you think you are, you know? Right? To, to yeah, to recognize those voices and to be like, wow, I'm actually doing the best I can and I don't yeah. need to punish myself for what if whatever hole I'm in right now, but to just yeah. like instead use that energy to work together to rise up. Yeah, because when we have those um, those multiple and opposing voices within us, and they all you know do need a seat at the council table, but we all need to re to recognize when when a job is complete. Like for me, my fear usually just indicates that I need to attend to something. So when fear comes up, I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen to you. And then, okay, you've done your job. I'm not going to go take care of this thing over here. Um, what I was going to say is that when all those voices are just talking nonstop, we actually become um, immobile. 
paralyzed. Nothing is happening. We're not moving. And that feels even worse, mm-hmm. I feel. So we we need to acknowledge the existence of the fear or the shame and thank it for for giving us a little kick in the butt to do something. Yes. And then and then move from a place of love, knowing that it is an act of self-love to take care of your money. Yes. It's it's an act of self-love to ask for your value. It really is. Because a lot of times we feel like working with our money, taking care of it, budgeting is like a punishment, but really it's it's an act of self-love. Mm-hmm. It so is. It's something that will nourish us and help us to give back in a bigger way. Um, yeah, I'd want to, I'd love to hear you talk about legacy and just what that means to you and how you help people with um, the legacy they're given and also the legacy they want to leave behind. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about legacy in the last couple of years. And, um, in different ways, I, there's like the financial legacy, as in, you know, what are you leaving behind to your family and those that you're leaving behind and taking care of them? There's that legacy. And then I think about the like spiritual and intellectual legacy, which I feel is highly connected with the reason why we came to this earthly plane to begin with. You know, what were you meant to do when you came here? How are you meant to beautify, nourish, and contribute to this world? And let's honor that legacy. Um, Maybe it's through, you know, taking care of animals. Maybe it's how you raise your children. And it doesn't have to be um, this like wide scale, like global impact. When people think of legacy, they think, oh, well, I mean, I'm not going to be the next Oprah Winfrey or something or <clears throat> that kind of thing. But it doesn't have to be like that. It can be a more of a small scale. Like maybe your legacy was helping your community plant more trees. And maybe your community is only a thousand people. That's okay. Um, and I want to help, you know, matriarchs and and the elders of the family honor their vision as they transition out of this plane. Figure out, you know, how they utilize their voice, how they pass on their stories to their families, and are they going to live on that way as well? And get get the different generations within a family, within a structure, within a collective, um, on the same page, working together. Yes. As a whole and as an, uh, and as individuals, because it can be tough. Because sometimes a younger generation may have I- an idea of what tradition looks like, and may think, "Oh, I have a more efficient way of doing it," or "I want to focus on on sustainability more." What have you? And how do we honor all members and all parties? But we all have a right to to express our legacy and live it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's so much that we can do. So just bringing the focus to that and really asking those deeper questions, like, what do I want to leave behind? And, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about my grandfather who cared so much about the wilderness in the boundary waters, the, this canoe area in northern Minnesota. And like, when I think of my grandparents there and like what they were able to do to help protect that land and to bring people to see that land. And it's just like, it's so powerful when we leave something like that behind. Something I sometimes do is invite my clients to write their obituary and to, yeah, yeah, like to think, really think about like, what would people say about me at the end of my life? And also to write an obituary of like, the woman who really followed her callings, the woman who mm. took those risks or the woman who was, you know, did something out of the box. What would people say about her? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when I, um, I was just thinking, when I think about legacy, I think about, are we living cohesively? Mm. 
And what I mean by that is that in our mo- modern world with different companies and business, businesses and corporations and activities, sometimes we can feel and be so fractured in the sense of this is how I show up when I'm at my corporate job. This is how I show up when I'm soccer mom. This is how I show up when I'm with my girlfriend or boyfriend or my friends. Um, this is how I do business. In my home life, I like recycle like like really, really well, but my business that I run isn't really sustainable and doesn't recycle. So when I think about legacy, I thinking I think about a remembering why you got into business in the first place. It's to live a happy and and great life and share your ideas. But do you have to be different people at these different Mm -hmm. things? I know we can't be the same person because different energies bring out different aspects of ourselves. But on a fundamental level, like does our ethos drive our actions in all places? And sometimes it isn't. So sometimes when we think about legacy, it's having those conversations and working through them and then figuring out how do we change the structure of somebody's business to honor the legacy they want to leave behind personally as well. It it goes in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Recognizing all the places where we our energy is dispersed and how it can be a, a more whole picture. Yeah. Whole self. Yeah. 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 And I'm curious too about your time working in a more corporate environment or for a business or for other people and that shift that you made working for yourself. Was there something like that going on of like, oh, I'm kind of fragmented. How can I come together? Or what was that decision like for you and that step? And I know there are so many people out there, you know, in that choice of like working for someone else versus having their own vision and Mm -hmm. make peace with that. Yeah, I I definitely. (laughs) Yeah, no, you bring up a really good point. I I hadn't, I don't think I thought about in that context, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I did, I did feel fragmented um, because the conversations I really enjoyed having um, around money, honey, and prosperity, they weren't happening at the table. They were in the sense that um, I would have them, but they weren't in the sense that that wasn't the way you're supposed to to do traditional financial advising. (laughs) And, um, And I really got excited talking about the fears and and like the soul questions around money, honey, before putting plans into action. And I found that there were so many rituals and practices that I was doing behind the scenes to honor the work that I was doing on the corporate level. Um, and I felt like, why am I hiding this? Like, why can we not openly marry our spiritual practices with our financial practices. Because in my family, they go hand in hand. Um, That's how I was raised. And that's how I am now, you know, allow myself to live. And and I I have experienced more success by living that way. So has my family and I know others have too. So it was just a matter of, yeah, I wanted to be more honest about who I was and, and that if I were to sit down and talk to somebody about their prosperity and, and all that kind of stuff, that we would be able to have that conversation in in their own context. Like what does, you know, what did their ancestors do to bring in prosperity and wealth? What do your families do? Like what are your superstitions and your practices and and how are you moved spiritually to celebrate financial nourishment? Um mm-hmm. So yes, I was fragmented and leaving allowed me to, yeah, really marry those parts of myself and share them more honestly. Mm-hmm. And that's a courageous step you know, to really honor the, the calling of the heart. Definitely. Are there any um, fears that you have faced more recently? Anything that was like taking a step 
or um, anything that has scared you or anything that you have been able to step more fully into or overcome in your life more recently? Oh my goodness. Um, I'm only thinking, saying that because I feel like I've had many of those moments in the last year. I felt like 2018. (laughs) I don't mean to be laughing, but I am. I felt like like a cosmic bomb went off. I'm not really sure how to explain that. (laughs) Yeah. It was an initiation year, I think. Yeah. A lot of people. Um, And it was interesting to watch like the world and interesting to watch myself experience the world. You know, I know, I know last year, a lot of fear came up for me, like fear around, you know, what are the appropriate conversations to be having and how do we have these conversations? Um, How do we have conversations from a place of love and peace? even when there's anger and rage included in that conversation, but for it to always come from a place of love. Hmm. Um, And that was something that I found challenging, Um, really challenging to stay rooted and seated in that place. Um, So that in the end, our solutions and actions guide us to the final place of mutual respect and love and honor and celebration of each other's uniqueness. Um, so I, I went through a lot of fear last year around, yeah, those conversations, like how to have them, when to have them, who are we safe to have them with? How do we not trigger people? Um, so that was 2018. And then moving, and then near the end of the year, here's something that happened last year that really, really shocked me. And that was, I was in um, deep meditation at a retreat where I was working with animals in particular, because I love working with their consciousness. They're so wise. And I was just asking questions around, you know, how can I be of service? What can I do next? How can I show up? And in that, that meditation, the, the first message that came through was shut everything down. And I was like, what does that even mean? And how can I shut everything down? Because, <laughs> I mean, um, I'm in business for myself. I ha- I'm, I'm like supporting people. I can't just, just walk away from that. And I love what I do. And I was like, but I, I – at first I tried not to listen to that. However, as like a month went past, I realized, no, in order for me to really like hear and listen what my next directions are and honor expansion and evolution and change within the self, I really did have to shut down how I was seen or portraying myself, like allowing myself to shed all of the skins. Yes. And sometimes that requires silence. And in the world of social media, it can be really difficult to stay silent um, and, and, and still feel like you're being productive. But something I've learned over the last, I don't know, six months since I've been doing this, and I haven't actually talked about this publicly at this point, is that I feel like in the silence, I was more productive. Even though on the surface, it may not seem like things are happening, I feel like um, on an internal level, it allowed me to be more honest about who I want to serve, how do I want to work, um, how do I want to show up, and how I um, am not going to allow myself to be dictated by formulas or way to do things. Like even allow myself to be even more honest about how I want to show up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I went through a really similar thing about a year ago and the clear guidance, it was just like I went, I actually, a few months before that, I had published a book 
my first book out in the world. It was a memoir. It was about my travels through India. And it was an amazing journey to come all the way into publishing it. And a few months after it being out and doing some events and all of the things and the lead up to the launch and all of it, I was just like, I need to go into hiding. (laughs) I need to like just close, you know, close things down for a little bit to really honor this huge thing that happened and also to rebirth in a way to see what wanted to come next. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I couldn't do that while trying to stay up on top of newsletters and podcasts and um, social media and all of that. So yeah, I think that's an amazing gift to give to yourself when having that time, having that space and it's really great to hear that that you felt that was really productive for you. Um, I think we're so conditioned to just like constantly be responding to the outside world and all the requests that are constantly coming at us. So mm-hmm. to take that time of like, and also to be seeing what everyone else is doing and letting that inform and reflect on you know, what we're doing, but to mm-hmm. like really have the space to have that come from within. Yeah. I I was just thinking about like how scary it can be to to show up as as one thing and and have a certain aspect of yourself be seen and then at one point feel like that aspect isn't enough anymore. Like you want to share and show other parts and be known as other things and how do you um, navigate that switch over because so often, at least in, in again, in this, the social media world that we live on, like we're seen as one thing, one aspect, you know, for example, with you, with the book tour and like launching the book, it's like, okay, for these months, like I'm known as like the budding author. Yeah. Okay. I am an author. I'm on a book <laughs> tour. And then it's once that's done, it's like, okay, well, okay, well now who, who am I? Cause I'm not only a book author anymore. I'm actually more than that. And how do I show up as a whole? Yes. Yeah. And that can be really scary in itself. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, so many pieces, the journey of entrepreneurship and being seen and putting new things out there. It's vulnerable. It can definitely be vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. And that vulnerability can get interesting when we're navigating um, financial relationships. You know, when you're really showing who you are and you're wondering, you know, are they going to see the value that I offer? Yes. You know, can I ask for the value that I really want to receive for this energy exchange? You know, that can be a hard conversation to have, but I really feel like when we allow ourselves to sit in the seat of love and honor that whatever experience the other person goes through, that's their experience to process. And um, and it's not necessarily a reflection on your own value. As in if you have a certain rate that you ask for, for your clients and for the people you work with, some people, for some people, it might seem like, oh, nothing. That's like chump change. And for other people, they might feel like, whoa, that's like my entire two months rent. I can't do that. That's crazy. And all the feelings in between. And I'm just wanting to say out loud that that's that person's experience. It's not necessarily a reflection on your value as a person and what you offer. Yeah. And it's uh, how do we, how would you support people to recognize their value within rather than the reflections from the outside? (laughs) Yeah. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. You don't have to know the answer, but we're all kind of on that path. Yeah. No, we're definitely all on that path. And that's a conversation I have with my clients all of the time. And it's always changing, you know, because one moment they see their value numerically, if you're going to put it in a numeric way at this price point, you know, in terms of rates for work. And then, and then a month later they feel like, oh, wow, it's, it's this high. 
And ultimately it's, I ask my question to them is, if you were to get a paid a certain amount, whatever amount that is, whatever your number is, can you show up fully invested in that moment? If you can show up, if you show up and you feel a little bit of resentment or a little bit of, wow, like I'm giving so much and I'm not getting enough in return. I'm still in quotes, hungry, not nourished by this experience. Then you know, you're not asking for your value and it doesn't matter really what that number is. That's truly up to you as a person and the life that you want to live. Because some people, their rich lifestyle is them having a little house, you know, on a a cottage yard and it only costs them maybe $100, $300 a month to live. And that's more than enough. That's their version of wealth. So you know, them asking for a certain rate is going to be a different experience than someone else that's needing more. Yeah. Um, but we know that feeling. I, I, I feel like if you haven't had the feeling, I celebrate you. But I feel like we all know that feeling when we've given someone, in quotes, too good of a deal and you show up to the experience and you kind of have a little bit of resentment and you don't want to give them the full deal of who you are in that moment because they didn't in quotes pay enough. Yeah. Um, And in that moment, we're like all parties disservice, you know, no one's getting a good experience out of this. So even if it's just $5 more or $5 less, whatever it is, just be honest with yourself, like check into your belly. And if it feels good, you're like, yeah, I feel good doing this. Then then that's your number. And then maybe you have moments where you're where you can afford to be more generous. And and then that experience feels good. And everyone wins in that experience too. Does that make True. sense? Yes. I I am familiar with that feeling. And I know and I feel like it comes right when at that point when it's like okay, it's time to raise the rates or it's time to shift into something new that you've gotten comfortable with where you're at and you're being asked to grow. Yeah. Um, And it can be kind of that like sticky transition of like, oh, really? Okay. And like you have to make the leap. But then it's like when you do, and I know this from my past because I have gone through those different bracket points at time and raised Mm -hmm. rates and, and, um, it is. It is a service to the people you're serving, and it is a service to yourself and your just general sense of contribution in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And and to go full circle back to that conversation with your husband, you know, giving purpose to your money ties into asking for what you really need, yeah. um, because. If you're say your your rates are low, because not everybody needs to have high rates. You know, mm-hmm. everybody can rate wherever they want to rate. But just check in and be honest with yourself. What is what is the purpose of the money that's coming in? Mm-hmm. Why am I asking for it? Because if I'm raising my rates, there's got to be a reason. Yes. And if you're honest about it, then then you know why you're doing something. Because if you're out there serving as a hungry healer, yeah, you know, you're actually not showing up in full capacity for these people. So allow yourself to be nourished by the work that you do. Um, Whether it's, you know, in whatever way you do it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. What are you excited about in your business now? Or what are you working on? Or what's coming up, if anything? Oh, my goodness. I feel like I'm still trying to marry everything. (laughs) <laughs> um, all aspects of myself into one so I can bullet point. I think one, I'm really excited about working with um, the consciousness of animals to support humans mm-hmm. and and their lives and their prosperity stories. Animals are so wise. They have so much to teach us. And when we invite them to the table to have a conversation with us, it can have so much healing 
for us as humans, but also so much guidance can come through to help people um, take healthier actions in their lives or take actions with purpose. Um, so I, lo- I love working with them with their consciousness, but I also love working with them directly and just being in their presence. So I love animals. And I'm really excited about, you know, working with the clients that I have and the future ones. Um, this year I've expanded myself more to, to meet people in person and do like in-person bespoke weekends and retreats, but they're all curated to the person, whatever they need, we come together and do that. And that's been really, really exciting. And on the flip side, I've been really excited about slowing down and being more particular and just working with specific people that I feel like I can really, really have an impact with and they get to have an impact in my life that way too. Um, So I can live a more balanced whole life. So I've been very excited about that as well. Amazing. Yeah. And do you have any like closing words or anything to leave us with before we wrap up our time together today? I just want to come back to the idea that love is money and love is a form of money. The more that we can share from a place of love, the more that we're nourishing and beautifying the world, the more we can allow ourselves to receive love and share love, I feel that ultimately we become more prosperous all around. Because if you can receive love, you can receive the nourishment of money, honey, and be able to ask for what you really want in this world. So if you are struggling with your financial story Or maybe you're sitting on stacks of cash, but you still feel empty, frustrated, listless. I'm going to encourage you to return to a space of love. Find out what you love doing in this world. Find out what breaks your heart. Find out what excites you and let that guide you. And I feel like ultimately we will all become more prosperous if we do that. So love is money. Yeah. Let's take a moment to just close our eyes and to breathe that in and invite everyone listening to do that as well. Just breathing in that sense of worthiness, our own innate value, not dependent on anything else outside of us. And breathing in that just sense of love and how our money and this energy that we can use in the world can be a way of giving and receiving that love. And so I'll bring my hands to my heart and just with such gratitude for Laura Rose and for all of you listening today, sharing this wisdom, receiving the wisdom, showing up in all the ways that you do, for your work in this life, your own sense of contribution. I bow. Namaste. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to our show today. We would love to hear what you think. Take a moment to hop on over to iTunes and leave us a review. We'd be so grateful to receive it. Until next time, namaste. Namaste.